going to read a few verses tonight from Deuteronomy 15. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release. Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day, for the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. If there be any among if there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in, in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we are met together tonight on behalf of and in concern for the cause of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and particularly the office of deacon which thou hast instituted in the Church. We know that the Church is thine, not ours but thine and thine alone. Thou hast chosen it according to the decree of sovereign election from all eternity. Thou hast made thy church thy dearest possession, thy beloved, the apple of thy eye. So much thou hast loved thy church that thou hast even given Christ, thy own son, that in his precious blood thy church might be redeemed and be thy everlasting inheritance. And Lord, thou hast given to us a place in that church, in grace, in sovereign and unmerited free grace, and hast blessed us with the blessings of salvation. And thou hast ordained that Christ, who died for his church, shall always, as he himself said to us, be present with us even unto the end of the world. And he is present with us, Lord, through the offices of minister and elder and deacon, present with the church in all the fullness of his salvation and in all his love and mercy and grace towards his people. 
We pray that as we talk together tonight and discuss some of the problems that arise in connection with the office of deacon, that we may have wisdom, understanding of the scriptures, and the spiritual ability that arises only from the knowledge of the scriptures to put the truth of thy word into practice in our calling. The problems are many. The devil who seeks to destroy the church knows that he will destroy it if Christ is not there. And to drive Christ out, he wants, if possible, to destroy the offices in the church. We pray that we may resist him and his foul and evil deeds and defend our office with zeal that through the exercise of it the blessings of our Savior may come to us and thy people. Wilt thou graciously keep us from sin? May our words be seasoned with salt and reflect the truth of thy word. May thy blessing rest upon our churches and thy people in them. And may we stand fast for the cause of the truth of the gospel. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I have two announcements to make before we begin our discussion tonight. One is that I made some additional copies of the questions for who either does not have a copy or left his copy at home. So I'll just start it here. If you need a copy, I found one. There's only nine there. I hope that's enough. Oh, wait. I can give you another one. I got my own here. The second announcement is that Claire, who is so gracious in taping these meetings has asked that when you speak, speak up a little bit. There's a mic here and there's a mic there. And some of you who are sitting a bit far away from the mic are not getting picked up very well. So speak up, will you, especially in this half of the room. Now, Howie, would you help me move this off a minute and that table on here, please? see your walking stock and feet, Claire. When I teach here, I'm always sorely tempted to take my shoes off and walk around stock and feet, but I haven't gotten up the nerve yet. You encourage me. <laughs> okay, men, um, let's get going then. We're going to discuss, first of all, tonight the questions under B2, the relationship of the deacons to the congregation. And uh, under there, there are four questions. We'll take them one at a time. The first one is, do deacons have a responsibility towards those who fail to give for the needs of the poor? And under that, some sub-questions that I think are related to that. What are some of the specifics implied in diligently collecting alms? That's a quote, you know, from the church order and from the form for the uh, installation of office bearers. How can a congregation be most effectively taught the biblical principles of giving aid? And how can a congregation be taught a proper attitude towards the poor? 
I was pondering these questions this afternoon, and uh, I'm not sure they're arranged in, in the right order, I thought to myself as I was thinking about them, you could very well make one under A the, the most important question, the chief question. But I guess that doesn't make a lot of difference. Let's talk about these questions together. The questions have to do with this main point. What does it mean that the deacons are diligently to collect alms? And how does that apply to the responsibility of the deacons over against the congregation? So let's talk about that first of all. Who, would, who has some ideas on that? that they'd like to suggest. Always takes a few minutes to break the ice, I guess, but let's not wait too long. You can address yourself to any of these questions. They're all related with each other, uh, related to each other. Who would like to begin? <coughs> yeah, John. With respect to question uh, 2A, how do the deacons know in the first place who fails to give to the needs of the poor? Because the benevolent offering isn't an envelope offering. It's just... Yeah, some of you men who have been deacons for a while, do you uh, have any way of telling that, whether people are... I'm not sure uh, whether that's exactly the, uh, the import of this question, whether that refers to individuals who the, of whom the deacons know that they are remiss in their duty. I had really interpreted it more in a general sense uh, when the deacons become aware of the fact that insufficient monies are being collected to provide for the needs of the poor, but I may be misinterpreting the question. Anyone like to comment on that? Is it possible, some of you men who are deacons, is it possible to know if there are people in the congregation who consistently fail to uh, give to the benevolent fund? Is that possible? John? It has been my experience that whenever the church has needed more funds than when they made the announcement, it's always been supplied. Yeah, that's been my experience, too. In fact, uh, I often get the impression that people would rather give to the benevolent fund than almost any other cause in the church. Uh, another hand. Herm. I'd like to add to that that uh, it's always been my feeling that when there's a special need, for instance, if there's a family, even in one of our other churches, or possibly a minister's family, whatever the need might be, that it's so very, very important that the congregation itself is first given the opportunity to be benevolent, rather than just simply write a check out of the benevolent fund and simply report that to the congregation. My point being that in uh, relation to those questions, as far as attitude is concerned, I think it's very important uh, to repeat myself that 
the congregation must be given the opportunity to be benevolent. But I think that's a very, very important thing that sometimes is overlooked. Rather than just have collections for the benevolent fund, they should be given an opportunity when there is something specific. You mean apart from the deacons? No, apart from taking a collection just for the benevolent fund as such. And if there is a special need, most often the congregation comes forward with an abundance when they're given the opportunity. All right, anyone else like to comment on that? What about these other questions then? What are some of the specifics implied in, quote, diligently collecting alms? Any of you have any ideas on that? Tom. Uh, I don't know uh, if that applies just to, you know, the collection for the poor there, but if it does, um, is it, has it been in the history of the church that the diaconate has had to seek other ways than through the offerings on the Sabbath to collect alms? It seems to imply that if there must be, there must have been another recourse or that they have done other. I have never heard of it being another way. Anyone? Howie. I think in the past at the first church when they had uh, a large benevolence uh, that sometimes older people would pass away and say a house would be donated to the church. An old house. Uh, you know, gifts like that toward the benevolence. Yeah, although uh, I don't know if that was the case in every instance, but oftentimes, especially when widows needed uh, help but owned a house of their own, then the deacons would make arrangements with her to continue to live in that house while they cared for her needs, and then upon her death, she would often, that widow would often give the house to the deacons. I know that happened a number of times, and not only in first, but in other churches too. Anyone else? John. Can we make this question broader than just questions for the benevolent fund? For instance, uh, like collecting for budget, whether, whether that is the, uh, under the realm of the deacons or whether that should be uh, just under the realm of the elders as far as making, say, delinquent budget calls. Let's hold off on that, John, till D. Okay. I think D under 2 is uh, directly addressing itself to that question. Let's limit this for the moment to alms, and we'll get to that later on. Anyone else? Tom. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let me sum it up then and make a couple of remarks about that by way of summary, and then if you still want to come back to something, you feel free to do that. In the first place, when both the church order and our form talks about uh, diligently collecting the alms, it certainly does not mean... Uh, be sure that you pass the collection plate. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't even mean be sure that you pass the collection plate 
with a uh, sober look on your face or anything like that. It means that the deacons are given by Christ the responsibility to see to it that sufficient alms are collected to provide for the needs of the poor. That's the deacon's responsibility to do that, to see to it that the people of God give sufficiently so that the needs of the poor can be cared for. That's certainly the idea. In the second place, uh, it certainly has been true in the history of the church that various different ways have been used to collect those alms. In fact, by no means has it always been true that the way of collecting them has been by means of passing the collection plate. In fact, I suspect that that's a fairly recent origin. Uh, you probably recall, maybe some of you, that early in one of my lectures I made the remark that in the Dutch churches, uh, the deacons would not collect alms for the poor by passing the collection plate in some of the Dutch churches, but visit the families and uh, visit all the families in the congregation before every meeting of the Lord's Supper and collect the alms in that way. And in that way, too, talk to the people about their responsibilities for providing for the needs of the poor. In the third place, I want to make uh, a comment about the uh, different ways in which that can be done. You have to remember, of course, that in certain times in the history of the church, especially when the church was being severely persecuted, but also in times of economic uh, uh, recessions, economic uh, suffering. It was sometimes impossible to collect money. Nobody had any money. And yet the poor still had to be cared for. And that's partly the reason why it is phrased in the church order the way it is and why it is phrased that way in the form for ordination. The form for ordination reads, this is the office of deacons that they, in the first place, collect and preserve with the greatest fidelity and diligence the alms and goods, notice, alms and goods which are given to the poor, yea, to do their utmost endeavors that many good means be procured for the relief of the poor. Now that certainly speaks of a whole lot more than just taking collections and, and distributing money. And there are times in the history of the church where that's necessary, where the deacons are responsible to go to the farmers in the congregation, for example, and get a bushel of potatoes here, perhaps, and a few bunches of carrots there, or go to the women in the church and ask them to knit clothes or to make clothes for the needs of the poor. All of those things are also implied. Whatever is necessary, under whatever circumstances the church finds herself, for the deacons to collect from the congregation the things which the poor need is the responsibility of deacons. And that can be, under certain circumstances, a very broad calling, too. We live in a money economy, of course, but I can remember as a child in the uh, Depression of the 30s. I don't know if any of you here lived during those times. Maybe Herm did and, and George. But nobody had any money. Nobody had any money. And the only way the poor could be cared for was by the deacons asking farmers in the congregation to contribute of their vegetables, which they had in abundance and making them available for the needs of the poor, and that was done. I remember that distinctly. In fact, we in our own family oftentimes received uh, all kinds of vegetables from the farmers, 
and that that was all we had to eat. So you have to bear that in mind. You have to look at the broader picture. The final remark I want to make is that I want to underscore what Tom said a few moments ago, that with regard to A, 2, and 3, that indeed ought to be the work of the pulpit, in my judgment. I don't mean to exclude the possibility that the deacons, when the need arises, may themselves contact the members of the congregation and teach them the biblical principles of giving for the care of the poor. But that ought primarily to be the responsibility of the pulpit. And the minister ought periodically to preach on the office of deacons and the calling of the church to care for the poor. And I think that's far and away the most effective way also to accomplish that, as Tom said. Okay, any other questions on that? Let's go on then. How can a congregation be most effectively taught the proper attitude towards seeking aid when needed? This looks at it from the other point of view. Not now, how can they be taught to give, but how can the people of God be instructed when they are in need to seek that need from, to seek help from the deacons? Who would like to comment on that? Anyone? Yep. We're going to wait with that one too, Gib. That's under C3C. That very question you ask is found there. So let's uh, let's wait with that for the moment. We'll get to it because it's a question. It's an important one too. 